Good morning. How's everyone? Uh, peace and blessings. I'm very glad to be here. As uh, I've told several people since I'm be I've been here yesterday, I'm very glad to be anywhere at 66 years old. And I, as I look around the room, I see people who are either in my age range or older, so I'm certain that you are very glad to be here as well. Uh, so I don't take life for granted, and uh, every day is a blessing and an another opportunity to try to get it right. So I'm on that continuous quest to try to be the best human being that I can be. Um, so I always start when I have the chance to talk before people publicly by giving thanks to the almighty creator, however you might conceptualize that force that allows us to wake up each morning and take a breath and creates order in the universe. Uh, and I do that always because that's the platform I stand on and my work is at its root of spiritual work. And so I always put that out there first. And also I put that out there because it allows me to be bold and fearless. Um, because I feel like, you know, if, I, if the most high created universe got me, then, you know, what? So, uh, but also I give acknowledgement to my ancestors. Those ancestors of uh, the people, melanated people in the so-called Western Hemisphere that um, are variously known by various names. Some people call us African Americans, some people call us black, some people call us Moors. Uh, whatever term that you want to use, uh, our ancestors made a, a tremendous contribution to the development not only of American society but of the entire uh, world. In fact, uh, world civilization really starts with us. So I thank those ancestors both in my bloodline uh, and those ancestors that uh, black people share collectively uh, whose legacy I'm attempting to continue. Uh, thirdly, I want to thank Mike and the Indiana Center for Middle East, East Peace for inviting me. And I always think it's a courageous thing when people invite me to speak because I don't operate by anybody's script and I'm not really in the business of making friends and being popular. And so, <laughs> and so you know, some places, a lot of places I get invited to speak one time, and that's it. Some <laughs> <laughs> but I hope I have something of value to say, maybe to stimulate some thought. And w what I try to do is, uh, you know, prick you and prod you a bit without, like, stabbing you in the, black, in the back so you have blood flowing out of you. But I'm trying to... Uh, you know, just prick your consciousness a bit and perhaps make you a bit uncomfortable so that you'll be introspective. I also want to thank uh, my comrades, the people that I work with, because this, none of this work is individual work. Um, this work of creating a more just world is, is a collective work. And, you know, we can kind of play an individual role, but we do it in a collective context. And so, although I'm a person who gets the opportunity to go around the country and speak and all that. The reality is that I'm part of an organization. The Detroit Black Community Food Security Network has close to 100 members, individual, family, and institutional members that are engaging in the work with me that I'm going to describe to you. So I want to acknowledge uh, those comrades who don't get the chance to come up and stand in front of microphones and speak. But for example, the ones who at the moment that I'm here at this mic speaking are at our farm in Detroit putting potatoes in the ground. So I always want to acknowledge the team that I'm a part of because I think it's important that we understand that we have to be part of a team. You can't engage in this work individually. Sometimes we have what I like to call free radicals. They don't want to be associated with the group. They just want to kind of be out here doing their own thing. But you have to, be, you have to find a group of people. In fact, Kwame Ture, I don't know if you all know about Kwame Ture. If you, know, if you heard of Kwame Ture, throw your hands up in the air. Okay, oh, he threw his fist up right on. So uh, you might have heard him of, by, of, of him by his former name, Stokely Carmichael, who, oh yeah, oh yeah, I heard that name before. <laughs> so uh, as many black people in America, he changed his name uh, maybe 1970 or so. You know, he was uh, head of, the, of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he helped to popularize the phrase Black Power, he didn't create that phrase, but he helped to popularize it. But uh, later on, he created an organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which still exists in many places around the world. But one of the things he said 
is that if you're serious about this work of liberation, that you have to be part of an organization. And if you don't see an organization out there that's aligned with your vision and values, then you have to create one. And so I just want to really stress that, that you have to be part of a group, a collective group that's making this work happen. And so again, I want to big up my comrades in Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Also, um, uh, Mike mentioned that we're breaking ground today on a, a new uh, 31,000 square foot building that we're building called the Detroit Food Commons, and it's going to house the Detroit People's Food Co-op. And so there are currently 1,460 members of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. So I want to big them up too because I'm part. That's another team that's part of this circle that I'm in. And finally, our organization is part of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, and I want to big up my comrades in that organization who are doing important work nationally. And you can Google that group, and there's all kind of very interesting information on the website that you might find to be useful. So I want to begin with a prayer that I wrote uh, probably in March of 2020, some, sometime around that period, when the pandemic was really first coming into public awareness on a large scale and things were beginning to shut down. And I had friends, close friends in Detroit who were who are dying. In fact, in March of 2020, I really, it dawned on me as I thought about the pandemic that I live in the state of Michigan, which at that time was the state with the second highest COVID rate in the United States. And then I lived in Wayne County, which was the county in Michigan that had the highest COVID rate in the state. And I lived in Detroit. I still live in Detroit, which is the city in that county, which had the highest COVID rate in the county. And then the zip code that I live in in Detroit was one of the three highest zip codes in Detroit in terms of COVID deaths. <laughs> and so in, in March of 2020, to tell you the truth, I didn't know for sure if I was going to make it to April, to May, because this thing was raging and we didn't exactly know, you know, there was a lot of misinformation or sister said yesterday, malinformation, I'll, maybe I'll use that term. So I wrote this, uh, po this uh, prayer during that time period, and I just want to start by sharing this with you. I stand in awe of the hidden power behind the sun and the magnificent miracle of creation, of the cycles of birth and destruction, of the universes and entities and timeless vibrations expanding towards realms incomprehensible. I give thanks for the delicate balance that sustains life on earth, for the trees, bees, oceans, rain, wind, and soil, for the birds, fish, snakes, and four-leggeds with whom we share the planet. I strive to, more, to move in a full awareness of my role in this matrix of life to treat the earth gently, to relate to my fellow beings with love and respect, to speak, with unre unre to speak unrestrained by fear and with kindness and compassion. I pray that the unseen causer of causes and my divine ancestors grant me the wisdom, vision, discernment, judgment, strength, steadfastness, and humility to be a worthy vessel to help usher in the reemergence of truth balance, harmony, justice, order, and reciprocity, I should. So having said that, uh, I'm very glad to be here in Fort Worth on Fort Wayne. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me, forgive me. I, forgive me, I was, in, I was in Fort Worth a couple years ago. Forgive me, I get these, uh, these European colonial names of these cities mixed up a bit, okay. So I was telling Mike, you know, there's a Fort Wayne in Detroit also, uh, named after the same criminal, Mad Anthony Wayne, right? And some of you who study his history know that he was very closely aligned with Andrew Jackson and was a supporter of the Trail of Tears and I, other, uh, I'm, I'm not going to use profanity today, so I'll just put a period there. Um, so. I'm very glad to be here on Earth Day, and uh, needless to say, it's important that we redouble our efforts 
to stop doing harm to the planet and to actually contribute to the regeneration of the planet, that we engage in regenerative practices because the biggest crisis facing humanity right now is the climate crisis that we're all facing. I mean, there's multiple other crises also. Let, let me state that clearly. But the reality is if we don't solve this one, all the other stuff doesn't matter. And so it's really important that we're focused on shifting policy, shifting both at the governmental level and also corporate level or institutional level. It's important that we shift our individual practices It's, in, it's important also that we shift our individual practices. So we need to think on these kind of three levels. How do we cause the government to behave in a more responsible manner? How do we cause the institutions and the organizations that we're affiliated with to behave in a more responsible manner? And how do we, as individual human beings, engage in practices that contribute to the healing of the earth? So I'm sure you all know that on this 52nd anniversary of Earth Day, uh, the planet is in increasing crisis, and we're seeing in real time before our eyes increasing and more intense wildfires. And when I say in real time, if you looked at the news like yesterday, uh, and, and you see what's happening in Arizona, and we've seen over several years what's happening regularly in California, you know, these aren't just freak occurrences. This is the future that we, we can expect given what we've done to the planet. Uh, we've, we're seeing in real time increasing and more intense tornadoes and hurricanes. We're seeing increasing and more intense floods. Again, this is in real time. If you, in the last week, if you've looked at what's happening in the Philippines, and if you've looked at what's happening, um, there was another, oh, in South Africa, South Africa, they've had terrible flooding problems in the last couple of weeks. And, Again, they're attributing this, at least in part, to global warming and the climate chaos that we're all facing. And we're seeing that these climate occurrences have a disparate impact on people in the global south. Um, people who live in what we used to call the third world, or used to be called the developing world. Uh, people of color throughout the world, where the majority of the world's population lives. Um, and we still see this continuing global dependence upon oil and other fossil fuels, in spite of all the science telling us that we need to be moving in another direction. So the question is how do we best address these things? And one of my friends and comrades, Dara Cooper, who was the founding director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, uh, often reminds me that you only get correct answers if you ask correct questions. And so the question is, what has spurred this climate, climate chaos that we're seeing? And I would uh, assert that one of the main culprits in this is the system of capitalism. Uh, let me state unequivocally that I and the organization that I represent are anti-capitalist. Anti uh, we're not into reforming capitalism, trying to make it kinder and gentler, none of that. Uh, that capitalism has spurred this mentality that profit is more important than people or profit is more important than the health of the planet. And so there's several other reasons that we think capitalism is a really bad system too, like this idea of individual ownership of property Right? That somehow if you have enough power or you have enough wealth that you can own part of the earth. And as we're seeing again in real time in, uh, with the war with Russia and, and Ukraine, that there's this idea that if you have enough military power, you can just take part of the earth and claim it as your own, which of course is what was done here in the settler colony that we call the United States of America. Uh, it's important to recognize that too, that this is a settler colony that there were indigenous people here before um, 
folks from England, Spain, France came to this land and they essentially dispossessed indigenous people of the land and often through military force took it. And so, you know, we think about countries like South Africa and Israel, we call those places settler colonies, but this is a settler colony also. And so part of what I think is important as we're thinking about how to create a more just and fair world is not to think about how do we make the colonial relationship better, but how do we end that colonial relationship that, so that all people have self-determination? Um, so although I'm vehemently anti-capitalist, I have to say that even some people that consider themselves socialist or Marxist also have an extractive mentality when it comes to the earth. So this is not unique to capitalism. This idea that the earth is here just for us to take from, right, is an idea that human beings with many different political ideologies have. And it's the surefire way to our destruction. In fact, I would say that, and hopefully I don't get struck down for saying this, I don't know. Um, but the interpretation of various Abrahamic religions that has come down to us suggest that human beings are here to have dominion over the earth. That we're here to dominate the earth is kind of what some religions teach. And I would suggest to you that that's a surefire road to our destruction. That the road to our survival is understanding that not only are we not here to dominate the earth, but we're here to participate in the matrix of life. That we're part of this matrix. And if we don't realize our connectedness and our oneness with that, we won't make it, right? We have a relationship with the other animals that occupy the planet. We have a relationship with the plants on the planet. I was listening to something, in fact, on the way here on NPR yesterday, uh, talking about uh, uh, forest, uh, forest lands and also open grasslands and how those serve as carbon sinks. They pull carbon from the atmosphere and put it into the Earth. And so this is part of how the Earth is designed, right, to maintain this delicate balance. Uh, so we have to understand that we have to function within that balance. Not, we're not here to dominate it. In fact, we would be better off to, by, by learning from animals and learning from plants uh, rather than assuming that we're some, you know, superior species and that we're here to dominate the planet. One of the aspects of the capitalist food system that has a tremendously damaging effect on the earth is the food system. And most of the work that I do right now is food system related, trying to make sure that we have a food system which is not only less harmful to the earth but is regenerative, is helping the earth to heal but also making sure that for human beings that all human beings have access to high quality nutrient dense food regardless of their so-called race, class, religion, gender, or whatever. Um, that industrial food system damages the planet in multiple ways. Uh, one of the things it does is deforestation. Um, you might know that Brazil is one of the top cattle producing countries in the world. And there's tremendous deforestation, cutting down a forest in order to make these huge cattle ranches to feed the desires of the Western world for more and more and more and more beef. Now, although personally I'm vegan, I'm not on a mission to try to get people to stop eating meat, because I think that's a useless, uh, a, a, a failing, <laughs> effort, we'll never, we'll never you know, do that. Um, but certainly, the planet would be better served by us reducing our consumption of meat. And then also, we have to realize that this idea of eating meat really is tied to our class notions. There's this idea that if you're affluent, then you can afford meat and that you should eat more meat and that kind of gives you more status in society. You know, most people around the planet do eat meat, but it's not the main dish. Like in America, you know, people have a big hunk of cow on their plate 
and then they have some peas to kind of make it look pretty, right, or something. Yeah. Now we see, in this society, we see the vegetables as a garnish, kind of just a supplement to the main part of the dish, which is that big hunk of meat. So most people around the world eat meat also, but they might eat it in a stew or soup where you have, you know, basically plant, uh, plant foods, and then you have small amounts of meat. But again, there's this idea that if you're affluent, then you can afford more and more meat. So we need to examine those ideas, and this is one of the ways that in our personal lives, we can contribute in a small way towards the health of the planet, just by reducing the amount of meat. A tremendous amount of land is used for the raising of cattle, hogs, chickens, and um, again, that's a problem in terms of climate change, but it's also a problem in terms of how those animals are treated. Uh, personally, I believe in karma, if you want to call it that. I, I don't believe that you can do things and not have some repercussion. That everything that you do, no matter how you frame it, if you, you, know, you can frame it like the ancient Kemetic did, folks did in terms of ma'at and the scales. I don't know if y'all up on that or not, but you've seen the scales of justice with the woman with the blindfold on, right? You all know that comes from Africa, right? You didn't know that? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, do some, do, Google, Google it. If you're taking notes, write this down. Ma'at, M-A-A-T, M-A-A-T. And you can go back to ancient, what we've been taught to call Egypt, which more correctly is called Kemet, right? Because one of the things Europeans have a habit of doing is going in places and renaming places and people. And so the Greeks renamed this place Egypt, but the people who live there call it either Kemet or Tameri or Tawi. I don't want to get into that. I'm getting ready to go down a rabbit hole, so I'm going to stop myself. But... <laughs> But the point is that uh, whether you uh, use this framing that the ancient Kemetic people used of ma'at, the scales, and, and basically what they said was when you, when you leave your body that your heart is weighed on a scale and there's a feather on the other side of the scale that represents what they call ma'at, truth, balance, justice, reciprocity, the things I talked about at the end of that prayer. And that if you've lived a good life, then your, your heart balances out with that feather. And if you've been a rotten scoundrel, then your heart is fed to kind of like a crocodile type animal, and you know that's the end of you. Or you can look at the you know the Christian framing, you know, going to the gates, St. Peter welcoming you, or however you look at it. There's some, you know, there's some accounting for what you do on this earth, and so. Uh, so we have to be aware of our actions and, you know, not just because we're trying to get some reward, you know, we, we shouldn't do right because we're trying to go to heaven or whatever, however you conceptualize that. We should do right for the sake of doing right, right, not because we're trying to get some reward at the end of the day. Uh, but another way, in addition to the deforestation that the food system is damaging the planet is through the use of pesticides, and uh, fertilizers that are chemically produ produced in factories that are inorganic. And one of the things we're seeing throughout the country is there's 120 what's called dead zones. Dead zones are places in bodies of water where no aquatic life can survive because of the, ex usually because of the excess nitrogen in the water that leaches the oxygen out and causes fish and plants to not be able to survive. The biggest of those 120 dead zones is where the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico. So this is what happens in industrial agriculture. If you take a pesticide and you spray it on plants, or you take a chemical fertilizer and you put it in the soil near plants, when it rains, those chemicals leach into the groundwater. And then groundwater empties into rivers and streams, and rivers and streams empty into lakes and gulfs and oceans. And so what we're seeing is the accumulation of these chemicals that are used in industrial agriculture winding up in our water system. So this is another way that this industrial food system is harming the planet. And then, of course, there's the issue of, of packaging, you know, how, how we, pa how we uh, package the foods that we buy. And, of course, we know that there's a tremendous amount of plastic being used for this packaging, and there's more and more research about what's being called microplastics, right, nano-sized particles that not only are in the water, 
And we're finding now that even in things like wild caught salmon, that they have microplastics in their system, but it's in the air, and so we're breathing it. And again, these things have a tremendously negative impact on us. And then there's the issue of loss of topsoil by the way industrial farming takes place, the incessant tilling of soil, which causes uh, erosion and eliminates the ability of the soil to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. And the reality is that we cannot replace the topsoil at the rate that we're losing it. Topsoil takes tens of thousands of years to, to be produced. And so you all have heard of the, the Dust Bowl that occurred in the 1930s where a tremendous amount of topsoil just blew away in the United States. Well, this is continuing. And you know, if we see ourselves as being guardians of the planet and stewards of the planet for future generations, we want to make sure that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren have a fertile planet upon which to raise food. The current practices will not ensure that that happens. So I want to switch gears for just a minute and read you a story. Y'all like stories? Do y'all like stories? Yes. See, let me tell you something. Mike, um, for many years, I only spoke to black audiences. And, and black, black people be like, you know, there's a feedback loop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, black folks, is a feel, feedback loop. They go talk to you from the audience. They might heckle you or whatever. And then I start speaking to white audiences, and everybody just like sitting looking at me like. <laughs> so I just want to invite you, you know, to, to, inter to be interactive. Um, so, yesterday uh, when, I, when I came, Mike picked me up from the hotel, he was very gracious, and I said, uh, can we stop at Starbucks on the way? And he was like, well, you know, we got to get to, you know, he had, he had an agenda, he was staying on point, and he was, <laughs> so, and I appreciate that. But I, I told him I was going to share a story today about Starbucks, and I'm not sharing this because I'm proud of the fact that I buy things from Starbucks. I went, I went there this morning. I'm going to admit that I did that. But this is something I'm not proud of. And so I'm publicly kind of sharing this with you. This is one of many contradictions that I'm holding, you know, as we move from where we are to where we like to be. Um, so this story is called Hot Cocoa. And um, I think you might you might find it interesting and, and it has some things in it that you might find related to the topic of the, of the day. So I wrote this during the, the middle of the winter, uh, not, not, not very long ago, you know, when it was really cold in Michigan. Does it get really cold here too? <laughs> okay, every morning for the past few weeks, perhaps to soothe the dis discomfort of social isolation and to provide an antidote to Michigan's winter temperatures, I've enjoyed a cup of hot cocoa. It's a good alternative to the Starbucks chai tea latte that I somehow got hooked on a few years ago. Here's how it started. I was riding in a van with seven or eight other people traveling from Detroit to Brooklyn in early November for the annual Black Urban Farmers and Gardeners Conference. Midway through the trip, we made a rest stop at a plaza where there was a Starbucks. One of my friends in the van, who was vegan, like myself, mentioned that she was going to get a chai tea latte made with soy milk. I had never been in a Starbucks and didn't know they sold anything a vegan could consume. I had never had a cap cappuccino or frappuccino or a latte and imagined Starbucks as a place frequented by bourgeois gentrifiers with small dogs. <laughs> Nevertheless, I followed my friend's lead and ordered the chai tea latte made with soy milk. I've never been a coffee drinker. My mother, father, and brother all drank coffee, but I never got into it. Frankly, I didn't like the taste. Even as a child, I didn't like coffee ice cream. I'd never drunk a, coffee, a cup of coffee in my life, with the ex exception of a shot glass size of coffee that I drank in synagogue, which I actually thought was tea at first, until I drank it. Uh, anyway, back to the rest stop on the way to New York. I returned quickly to the van to get out of the cold, windy Pennsylvania mountain weather. I settled back into my seat in the second row of the van. My comrades boarded and we were back on the highway. As I was holding the cup of chai, 
I suddenly realized the comfort that holding a cupful of a warm beverage brings to coffee drinkers. It was an aha moment. I slowly sipped my first chai tea latte as we barreled down the turnpike. It was great. Thus began my descent into the corporate hands of Starbucks. <laughs> I learned the tricky lingo used by Starbucks to describe the sizes of their cups. A tall is the second smallest size at 12 ounces. A grande, which means large in Spanish, is the medium sized cup at 16 ounces. And a venti, which means 20, is their largest size and is actually 24 ounces. On many a cold March, April, October, or November morning, I stopped at Starbucks before opening D-Town Farm. With the help of some of my comrades, I've come to more fully appreciate why I should not be supportive of Starbucks when there are local coffee shops struggling to survive. I have drastically reduced my trips to Starbucks, except for this morning, but occasionally enjoy a, still enjoy a chai tea latte. Maybe the hot cocoa I've been drinking for the past few weeks is taking the place of my beloved hot chai tea latte. But this story is not really about Starbucks or hot cocoa. Well, not exactly. I was making my cocoa one morning, and I perfected this method where I put two teaspoons of raw sugar in a cup, followed by one teaspoon of cocoa powder. I mix the dry ingredients, then heat up a cup of almond coconut milk, and I pour, the, I pour a little of the hot milk into the cup. Stir the ingredients until they dissolve, and pour the rest of the milk in and stir again. As I sat down in front of my computer with my cup of hot cocoa, I thought about the geographic origin of almonds, coconut, sugar, cocoa, and cinnamon, and how history has converged so that a descendant of West Africans with some slave masters blood in my mix is sitting in North America in a place French colonists called Detroit, drinking a morning beverage from cocoa from West Africa with sugar likely from Brazil, almonds probably from California, and coconuts and cinnamon perhaps from Indonesia. As we eat for health and pleasure, we don't typically think about the global systems that grow, harvest, process, and transport food from all over the world to our grocery store. Even the most radical among us have the expectation that we should be able to drive to our local grocery store and purchase our favorite products from anywhere in the world at any time of the year. You want tomatoes, avocados, oranges, or bananas in January in Fort Wayne? No problem. Global capitalism brings it to your neighborhood or a white suburb near your neighborhood if you live in an area impacted by food apartheid. They didn't get that. They didn't get that. <laughs> put, put them up on game later, all right? <laughs> um, our taste buds have become accustomed, in, in some cases addicted, to flavors and textures from faraway places. To be clear, for most of human history, people either migrated seasonally following plant and animal food sources or have, been primar or have primarily eaten food that originated where, near where they live. With more cross-cultural contact between peoples across geographic boundaries, traders seeking to make a buck transported highly prized foods I'm sorry, transported highly uh, prized food items from one region to another. In Sudanic West Africa, salt was so highly prized that when dried into blocks was a form of currency. Coffee from the highlands of Ethiopia became a valued commodity in the Ottoman Empire and later Italy and the rest of Europe. Sugar, cane, originating in Asia and transported to the Caribbean was so valued by West Africans that it became an economic driver for the enslavement of millions of Africans who were also transported to the Caribbean to plant, process, and harvest the cane. In some ways, the desires of European aristocracy for prized foods from around the world motivated the global exploration and later imperial designs of Western European nations. You may recall Cristobal Colon, that murderous scoundrel whose name has been rendered Christopher Columbus in the Anglophonic world, and after whose name the word colony is derived. He was in search of the mythic Golden Indies when he stumbled upon what is now the island of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. 
The Golden Indies were said to be rich in exotic spices as well as gold and jewels. What followed was 500 years of imperialism and colonialism that concentrated wealth and the wealth in the hand, well, I'm sorry, wealth and power in the hands of the global white ruling class and inversely underdeveloped Africans and the rest of the non-white peoples of the world. This relationship provided Western Europeans and later their American descendants, at least those who could afford it, with sugar, salt, pepper, corn, beans, melons, and other foods from the global south. The food system that provides most of our food today is the inheritor of this exploitive legacy of colonialism and imperialism. Capitalism invisibilizes the process by which foods from around the world end up on our plates and in our cups. The label on my box of powdered cocoa doesn't indicate a country of origin. Consumers thus don't have to think about where it came from, who grew it, who owned, so-called owned the land it was grown on, who processed it, who transported it, and how the profits were divided. We don't have to think about the environmental impact of clearing forest land for the farming of commodity crops or of transporting foods hundreds or thousands of miles. Fortunately, the label on my raw sugar is more transparent and says that that product is from where the tropical sun meets rich, fertile soil and cool mountain waters. Capitalism's got us by the taste buds. We're hooked and many of us will not return to a way of life where we, our friends and neighbors are producing most of our food. We're emotionally addicted to the taste and textures of our childhood. We have warm memories related to holiday meals or summer gatherings. In some ways, those tastes define who we are. We're addicted to the boost of energy that sugar and caffeine give our bodies. Ironically, many meetings to plan the revolution have been held over cups of coffee. So while we're thinking about how to create more justice in the world, let's get some thought to how the current food system promotes land grabbing, exploitation of workers, environmental degradation, poor health, mindless consumerism, and the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of already wealthy white men, and to what a fair, racially just, non-exploitive, non-extractive food system looks like. By the way, that cocoa was great. So um, I'm going to say just a few more words and we're going to go into Q&A. And I hope maybe, you know, as you reflect on that little story, there's some things in it that you can pull out and perhaps have some value to you. Um, so I, I can't end without calling out the system of white supremacy. And I'll start by saying that this notion of race is a false notion. It's not a scientific reality that what we call race is a social construct that human beings have created. And primarily it was created by European pseudoscientists uh, in order to elevate the position of <laughs> Europeans in the world. This idea of being white was created. This idea of whiteness was created. That didn't always exist. People were either French or German or you know, whatever their ethnicity was. But this idea of whiteness was created as a way of dominating the rest of the peoples of the world. And so it impacts us all. Uh, if you are defined as white in this society, then you probably have notions, in fact, not probably, you have notions associated with the superiority of people who are defined as white. And you have notions associated with this idea that all that is of good and value in the world was created by people who are defined as white. Both of those things are false. Uh, if you are a person who is defined as black in this society, we have also internalized, or another person of color, we've also internalized uh, notions related to the system of white supremacy, but usually for us it happens in the way of having a, a sense of inferiority and a lack of confidence and this idea that white people have some monopoly on shaping the world. And so I, I wanna say more about it, but I, I'm not going to for the sake of time. I would just ask that you do a deep dig into starting to understand more about this concept of race and how we all have internalized notions related to it and how this, uh, this idea of European superiority is a debilitating uh, way of looking at the world. It goes very deep. 
even the name of the, of the planets, including the one that we live on, come to us from European deities. The names of the days of the week come to us from European deities. And so we are centering Eurocentrism in our thinking. And most of us don't think about it. We just say, oh, it's Saturday. You know, yesterday was Friday. We don't think about what these things mean, right? So, but, you know, so we have accepted that Eurocentrism and a European way of looking at the world is the universal way through which all people should look at the world. Again, I want to say more, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to say more about that. I also have to call out patriarchy and say that uh, one of the things I'm struggling with as a, a, a man, a person born as a male, is a system that ascribes more power to people who are identified as men. And it suppresses women, but it also suppresses men because we have feminine energy inside of us. And so if we're on some toxic masculine trip, which I used to be on, I'm acknowledging it, and I'm still healing from that, if we are caught up in that, then we're suppressing part of the energy with inside of ourselves. Not only that, but the divine feminine energy is what we need to come forward in order to heal the planet. Again, there's a lot more I like to say about it, but for the sake of time. Um, so I'll just end by saying, uh, in addition to you know, the fights that we're all involved in to change the big stuff, you know, big systematic stuff, which is really important. We also have individual responsibility. And we have the responsibility of behaving in a way which is moral, ethical, and which uh, seeks to create balance and harmony in the world. Um, I'm not gonna talk about what we're doing in Detroit, except just to say that I have to be back at one o'clock because the groundbreaking for the Detroit Food Commons if you want more information on the work we're doing, you can go to our website, which is www.dbcfsn, dbcfsn. So thank you for your patience. We're going to open it up for a few minutes for Q&A. Malik is going to be walking out that door in seven minutes. So we've got time for two quick questions and two quick answers. Please, Miriam. Uh, what's your zip code in Detroit? <laughs> what's your zip code? 48221. All righty. Fair trade. Yes. No, extremely important. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, fair trade is an important step. And the, there's many companies that are, well, not many, there's a few companies that are uh, kind of adopting fair trade practices. I think it's extremely important. I think co ops are extremely important. Um, I got, got a little critique last night from my sister in the back about co ops, and she's, she's telling me there's some other ways that are even more progressive than co ops which I, I look to learn from, but I think co-ops are one of the most important things that we can engage in right now. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Yeah, Joy. Uh-huh. Dot uh, org. Dot org. DBCFSN dot org. Another question? Yes, sir, please. And turn the microphone on. Hello. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, so I'm wondering, particularly how y'all engage with youth and how you use like a physical relationship with the planet to, to bring about like a, a broader content. So how do we grasp things at the root when we're actually mm -hmm. digging up roots? Okay, thank you. And I'll just say quickly that really what got me into this work is I was principal of an African-centered school for about 20-some 20, 20 years. And so at the school, we wanted to teach the children this lesson about being connected to the matrix of life and being aware of their relationship to plants, to insects, and to the rest of the planet. And so we thought that gardening was a way to teach that, as well as the fact that we think it's incredibly important that we break away from the corporate food system, even if it's on a small level, and begin to re-empower ourselves by doing things like growing tomatoes and collard greens or whatever. So, so that connection with the earth is extremely important. It's a, a fundamental part of the work that we're doing. In fact, I would assert that we can't come up with any solutions to the problems humanity is facing unless we ourselves are whole 
and part of our wholeness has to be connecting with the earth energy. And so we can't do that being in buildings all the time and being disconnected with, from nature. If we do that, our, our solutions will also be disconnected. It will not be holistic. So it's extremely important. We have a youth program called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program in Detroit. And it's rooted in this idea of connecting, reconnecting young people with nature, giving them all kinds of experiences where they can learn their oneness with, uh, with creation. One more question. Yes, Annie, please. Um, this really your story was wonderfully I guess I got six more minutes. Okay. You can take a couple more. Thank you. Your story was wonderful and so rich in detail and information. Is there a way we can get a copy of that? For sure. <laughs> now, I'll send it to Mike and he can he can get it out to the rest of you. Good. Yes, sir, please. Here, we got the microphone right here, right behind you. Have you published anything, and, uh, or do you have something in mind that you are going to publish? Uh, I've been working on a book for a long time, and you know, I so I was talking to my sister Diane earlier, and she she said I'm a doer, you know, all this talk, you know, and I, and I, and I can relate to that totally. You know, I I do talking, you know, Mike asked me to come <laughs> speak, and you know, so yeah. You know, I talk, but I'm more a doer also. And so sometimes the doing is so intense that the sitting down and finishing this book hasn't happened. Um, I do have a, a family foundation that has put up some money for me to take a sabbatical. And uh, I'm strategizing with my board on when I can do that, because we're building this major building that's going to take a year to build. And then we have a whole major operation. And so I'm trying to figure out how I ease out and take this sabbatical. But when I do the sabbatical, I'm going to finish the book. But I have not published anything yet. Um, I'm more out here doing, doing the work. So, but I, I would say the best thing you can do is you want to Google me. There's about 50,000 yeah, you know, speeches on YouTube, me ranting against white supremacy and capitalism. <laughs> Malika, uh, if, if folks wanted to visit D-Town Farms, if they wanted to come and see the seven-acre farm, yeah. uh, just tell us quickly if, we want, if someone wanted to come and visit. Um, say it again? So I would say go to our website. You know, the website I gave earlier, dbcfsn.org, and you can, um, it has information on the, on the farm and how, if you want to visit, we have a form you fill out just so we know what day you want to come and all that. But we welcome visitors. What we're doing is a model, and we like sharing that model. You know, we have lots of problems also. One of my heroes was Amilcar Cabral, who was the head of the organization which brought about independence in Guinea Bissau. And one of the things he said that really struck me, he said, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. So we share both our successes and our challenges at D-Town Farm, and there's no shortage of challenges. Uh, but we're willing to share that with whoever wants to come and learn from the work that we're doing. Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is going to take a field trip in July to D-Town Farms, and we're, we've been talking about that, you and me, and it'll be great to be with you. One more last question quickly, and then a quick, yes, ma'am, please. That's Thank you so much. Thank you. It's nice to meet somebody as part of a team, and everybody here that is with really important. Good. So one of the things I work towards is food systems that provide care and keeping them alive in the In the soil, you mean? In the soil, everything. Because everything that's around us right now came from the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And those nutrients are no longer there. Yes. And so those are the things that I'm contemplating about this. Yes, you're, abso you're absolutely right. So if you buy a tomato today, it has much less nutrient content than a tomato 100 years ago, primarily because of the soil, because of the damage that's been done to the soil and the types of farming practices and this insatiable need that Americans and the Western world has for all kinds of food that's driving this industrial food system. And so you are absolutely right. And when I use the term regenerative practices, and you know, I'm hitting on a lot of things and kind of moving on because I don't have a lot of time. But one of the most important things that farmers can do is engage in composting and other practices that add nutrients to the soil and that pull, pull carbon from the atmosphere. All these kinds of things are regenerative practices which help to rebuild the fertility of the soil. But the, 
the, the most important thing in farming, in organic farming, is building the soil. In fact, one of my friends told me that we're really not growing vegetables, we're really growing the soil. And so if the soil is healthy, you're going to have healthy, nutrient-dense plants. And so I would just say, you know, I stand in solidarity with you that one of the most important things that we can do is to stop destroying the soil and then to begin using regenerative practices which help to rebuild the soil. So with that, I'm going to say uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. I'm getting ready to dip out of here. Peace out. Thank you.